I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So for the second week in a row, we had a super long gospel lesson. Um, And this time, it really reminds me of that joke, um, that baseball kind of joke, where it's like, who's on first and what's on second? And they're constantly going back and forth, and nobody can figure out what the heck they're talking about. Um, And when we were in Bible study this week, I was talking about that I think this word, see actually means understand because it's just this total missed opportunity to understand each other they are just everybody's talking and nobody's listening and nobody's getting it and i'm kind of amazed that at some point we don't have little directions like and jesus sighed like that he's just so frustrated (laughs) that people do this i also pointed out the missed opportunity it kind of makes me sad that at one point um They ask him again, like, where is Jesus? And the formerly blind man says, I do not know. And I so wish instead that John had written, I don't see him. Because I just thought that would be so funny. Um, (laughs) Anyway, so there's a number of different themes that I want to mention for this week. And I also want to point out yet again that we are in Lent, which is that mini master class in baptism. And so constantly wondering, like, how do the lessons and the things that we're hearing this week relate to our understandings of baptismal theology and our baptismal promises and the covenant? Um, But first, I want to talk a little bit about the first lesson we heard from Samuel. And it's the story, of course, of David's anointing, who becomes King David. You know, pretty much the most powerful ruler that we hear of in the Hebrew Bible in terms of um, not just showing people the way to God and the Psalms and everything, but also being a very messy human being, you know, a lot of good things to follow and a lot of really bad choices that we wouldn't necessarily want to do. And that reminder, I mean, surely God knew who he was, right? When he said, this is the one to anoint, and yet it was okay. Like, he still had the things in him that the world needed, and he didn't have to be perfect, just like none of us. And so when we feel that stirring within us, God nudging us or calling us to do something, we can say yes with confidence because we can still be totally messy. We can still make mistakes. We can be imperfect. We can even do it wrong. We, you know, God can be pointing right and we are looking left and thing and saying, I don't see. Um, and God will just keep trying. But one of the things I'm aware of is that um, that line in 1 Samuel that we heard today, and I will show you what you shall do. You know, we heard that um, Samuel kept thinking, oh, it's this one that I need to anoint. And God was like, nope. He'd be like, oh, I'm sure it's this brother I'm supposed to anoint. And God was like, nope, not him either. And he kept going and going and going. And, you know, Samuel's trying to show up. He's trying to figure it out. And then he hears from God, there's another one. He's actually the youngest. He's out with the sheep. He's the one. So let's wait on him. And so we also heard, the Lord does not see as mortals see, for the Lord looks at the heart. And God, again, really sees who we are. But that's that invitation to be paying attention and listening. And we talk about it sometimes as intuition, right? We don't often say things like, I heard God tell me to do X, because that doesn't often fly super well. You can always say it to me, I'll believe you. But the rest of the world might be like, "Uh, are you sure? Um, And so we talk about intuition, or we talk about, I had a sixth sense, or I had a feeling I should do whatever. And I'm a firm believer that just like any of our other senses, the more we listen and pay attention, whether it's the voice of God or our intuition, the stronger it becomes. And I have always been a real strong proponent of my own intuition. If I have a sense of something, I tend to follow it. Most of the time it works out. 
Sometimes it doesn't, but I figure it's worth the trying. It's worth the trusting, whatever that voice is, to follow it. And an example that I had of that was a little over eight years ago. It was the day before my youngest's 10th birthday. And at that time, um, my kids and I, we all lived with my mom in Superior, Colorado. And um, my mom had leukemia. She had a very long term, of, long form of leukemia, um, chronic lymphocytic, CLL. And so she had had it already for, gosh, I think 12 years, um, and had been in and out of chemotherapy and other things and was actually doing really, really well. Like she felt better than she had ever felt in years. She was on this test drug and it was going great. And she had actually just been to her 50th college reunion for nursing school. And she had made this whole trip to Illinois and Indiana to see all these friends. It was like this glory trip for her. Like she was doing great. Anyway, she was back home and um, getting ready to go out to dinner with her best friends to her favorite restaurant in Boulder. And I was on the phone and we hadn't connected about the birthday yet. I don't know if your family does this, but you know, you have to have a plan. Who's getting the cake? What are we eating for our meals? When are the presents going to happen? How is it going to be the special person's special day? So we hadn't connected about it and she was going to dinner and I was on the phone and I thought, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. We'll just connect when she gets home. So we sort of did the wave as she's going, you know, see you later, that whole mouthy thing that you do when you're on the phone. And um, so she goes, and my call wrapped up pretty quickly, unexpectedly. So I thought, oh, I could run out and, you know, just connect with her really fast now. And I thought, oh, no, it's fine. It's early. We'll I'll connect with her later. And I thought, you know, it's not a big deal. I could just walk out to the garage. So I go out and I open the garage door and I see the electric garage door is almost down to the ground. My mom, you know, the car is gone. And I thought, oh, I've missed her. Not a big deal. I'll catch her when she gets back. And I thought, how hard is it to push the electric door opener? Like I have to make no effort really to open the door. So I thought, oh, I'll just push the door open and see what happens. So the door goes up. My mom is actually in the street backing up, but she pulls back into the driveway and we spend, you know, just a couple minutes. She's in the car. I'm in the driveway connecting. Who's going to get the cake? What's going to happen? You know, all the little things. We have to 10th birthday. It's a big deal. Double digits. So we connect about that and she gets ready to go and, um, you know, see you later. And I said, well, I'm so glad I caught you. And I said verbatim. I just wanted to say one last I love you before you go. And she said, oh, that's so nice. You know, that's great. I love you too. I'll see you when I get back. So off she goes. And two hours later, I get a phone call and my mom had had a massive stroke at dinner and she died. And it was, it was shocking, as you can imagine, and very unexpected. And I thought, thank God, literally, that I listened. Thank God that when I kept thinking, ugh, I'm not going to bother. It doesn't matter. I kept getting that nudge. Go say, go give that one last I love you. And I did. And I'm so grateful because that has brought me so much comfort in her passing so much remembering of like that wasn't me that wasn't me who was the one who was willing to go because actually I kept thinking why I shouldn't go that was God saying and I will show you what to do and thank God I listened because that one last I love you was the last words I spoke to her and I wouldn't have had that gift from God because I feel like that was much more about me. She knew I loved her. That was so much more about my ability to tell her. And I'm so grateful. And so my invitation, because you know I always have to invite you to something each week, is wondering what is the Lord seeing in your life or in the world that is not as mortals see, but looking at your heart? Are looking at the heart of the world's longing 
in a way that you might be able to show up so that we can do all that is good and right and true as we heard in Paul's letter this morning and that rejoinder for sleeper awake. I think we often move through the world kind of asleep. We're not paying attention. And it makes sense because the world is hard, right? There are times when I think, oh, it'd be so much easier if I just had a closed hard heart. Because it hurts to see the pain and the suffering and the struggle, not just of those we know and love, but just of the world in general. But we're constantly being called to be awake, to show up, to be the hands and heart and feet of Christ in the world. And so when I look at our baptismal liturgy and I wonder, where is it showing up today? I turn to page 302 and I notice the questions. And I think this has to do with the fifth and the sixth questions that we hear And we'll hear again on Easter morning because we have two baptisms that day. Do you put your whole trust in God's grace and love? And we answer, I do. And then we say, do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? And we say, I do. And that trusting and that following and that obeying can sound like a heavy burden to carry. And there are times sometimes when we do have that sense that God wants us to do something that feels a little hard, to walk a walk that maybe is not the walk we want to be walking, or to say the thing that we really don't want to say because it's really hard to do. And yet if we trust that God sees our hearts and is showing up in love for us, we in turn can do the same. We can show our hearts, and we can show up in love not only for ourselves, but for the world. Amen.